greetings to all of you in today's session we are going to discuss about intermediate level chemistry which is helpful for your international entrance or any competitive examination in addition india level je advanced and je mains for uh, iit entrance and nit entrance examination neat chemistry for medical entrance examination telangana and andhra pradesh mcet for engineering stream in addition to all this if you are preparing for any competitive examination this kind of session will be very much helpful let's enter into our today's session here first question is given from iupac nomenclature iupac stands for international union for pure and applied chemistry name the following compound as per the iupac protocol this much long chain is provided to you and in that we have ketone ethyl hydroxy ethyl again ketone chloro butyl methoxy bromo triple bonded alkyne and the here is the long chain of 23 carbons in order to name this we have to follow certain rules and protocols provided by iupac nomenclature let's see how can we assign name and numbering for this compound in order to explain this first let's write the skeletal carbon chain like this so to avoid all the complexity over here just a skeletal structure is written over here where you can assign numbering from first carbon either this side right hand left hand we have two provisions to start numbering but here is the compulsory condition the priority plays a vital role here if you observe 1 2 3 4th carbon is acquiring triple bond whereas this end we have third carbon with ketone ketone obviously get higher priority over triple bond that's the reason why numbering will be started from this left hand side and moreover if you are starting numbering 1 2 3 4 5 like this so entire chain should be longer one longer chain is the parent chain okay and the shorter distance of the functional group is the more preferable one right so this is the way we have to go for naming the given organic compound in order to name this we have certain rules and regulations so in order to give the name for this long chain of organic compound here first of all we have to count how many carbons are resided the parent hydrocarbon chain is of 23 carbons if you count how many carbons you can find 23 carbon length of chain you can find that is the point number 1 and second is functional groups we have to segregate all the functional group present in the given compound how many functional groups are there so in the given compound functional groups highest uh, precedence is given for the ketone here ketone will get the higher priority over remaining all that's the reason why we started numbering from left hand side where it is the shortest distance regarding ketone right so that's the reason why highest priority for this ketone is uh, accorded now carbon atom of 3 and 9 so there are certain uh, main groups uh, around the third and ninth carbon if you see third and ninth carbon what groups are resided what main groups are present ketonic main groups are present right so this is the kind of identification we did the numbering of molecule based on ketone so ketone is the ketone is the main uh, uh, compound main functional group over here that's the reason why we have to go through this only right <laughs> and the numbering of the molecule with the ketone group itself and uh, left to right hand side we are moving why we are moving from left to right left side only ketone is present with the least numbering that's the reason why we are moving from left to right hand side right uh, when numbering is started from right to left uh, we will go with these uh, ketonic functional group numbering with the 15 and 21 if uh, there there are two choices two phases to to the coin right so that you can move either from right to left or else left to right so that if you start from the right hand side this uh, ketone and this ketone are accorded with the 15 and 21 numbering that is not yet all preferable right so that we are moving through the left to right direction fine the side chains are ethyl where ethyl are present ethyl are present on fourth carbon and also eighth carbon if you see uh fourth carbon is uh, accompanied by the ethyl eighth carbon is also having ethyl functional group any more ethyl only fourth and eighth are accompanied by the ethyl and if you see the 12th carbon butyl will be there uh, 15th carbon with the methoxy 18th carbon bromo will be there 
and uh, this is the triple bond over 19th carbon and 13th uh, sorry 6th and 13th carbons are having double bonds hydroxy is resided on the 5th carbon atom right so methoxy is present on the 15th carbon what uh, uh, what we are observing and uh, ethyl groups are present to ethyl we just saw fourth and eighth carbons are accompanied then 12th is accompanied by the butyl fourth and eighth diethyl are present mm, then secondary functional groups are hydroxy which is located on fifth carbon chloro is present on 11th carbon and uh, methoxy is there at 15th carbon atom bromo is resided on 18th carbon uh, so that uh, this is the way we can we can give numbering to all the uh, given functional groups. Okay, according to the alphabetical order, we have to go through A, B like that. So that bromo will come first because uh, bromo B is the number. Later on, we can go for remaining. So that uh, there are two double bonds. Double bonds are resided in 6th and 7th uh, carbon atoms. 13th and 14th carbon atoms are present. 6th and 7th, 13th and 14th. These two are the positions where you can find a double bond so that we can mention. So 6th and 13th diene. So 6, 13 diene we can mention because so double bond is located in between 6, 7 and 13, 14. That's the reason why. Fine. The arrangement of uh, functional groups like 18th bromo, 18th bromo, though it is 18th carbon uh, accompanied by bromo, but uh, being it is the alphabetical order B, it will come first, right? So this is the way we can assign and uh, 12th position butyl is there, 11th position chloro is there, uh, 4, 8th position diethyl is there, 5th position hydroxy is there, 15th position methoxy is there and 23 carbons they are. 23 carbon so that uh, let me mention uh, what ecosa 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 will be the parent chain length 6 comma 13 diene two double bonds are there and uh, one triple bond is there on the 19th carbon atom 3 comma 9 dione this will be the this will be the probable arrangement finally we will see how can we assign name for uh, the given entire lengthy chain of organic compound so let's put on all the numbers from starting to last carbon in the entire chain so that a third carbon with the ketone uh, fourth carbon with ethyl fifth carbon with hydroxy sixth carbon with ethyl again ninth carbon ketone again 11th carbon chloro is there 12th carbon butyl is there uh, where you can find 15th carbon methoxy is there 18th carbon bromo is resided, 19th carbon triple bond is there, and that's all. This is the way we can assign numbering for all the carbon atoms. Now, in order to arrange all these functional groups, we have to put on alphabetical order for that purpose. So the final name, 6th E. 6th E denotes what? Uh, on 6th carbon, we have double bond. No, the double bond is said to be a E. Integrogen means uh, similar groups are present in opposite direction like a trans direction. And moreover, 13th carbon also having one more double bond. That 13th carbon double bond is also said to be a trans one. Means uh, two opposite, uh, two similar groups are in the opposite direction. Fine. So th that's why 6E, 13E. This is according to geometrical isomerism. We can say it is somewhat typical naming of uh, given compound as per the IUPAC protocol. Entire uh, stereochemistry came into picture. Naming of the compound, alphabetical order. So many uh, things are present in this uh, screen so that it is more typical, we can say. Fine. 6E, 13E and uh, 18th bromo. Why we are writing? Because of alphabetical order, 18 bromo will come later on. Again, B, butyl, where it is, 12th carbon butyl is there that also uh, present over here. Later on, uh, B after C we have to write. So C for chloro, right? Chloro is present in 11th carbon, so that 11 chloro you can mention. Later on, ethyl, E. So after C, we, we will go with the ethyl, right? So ethyl are resided on fourth and eighth carbon as well. So that four comma eight diethyl you can mention later on. Fifth carbon is accompanied by hydroxy, phi hydroxy. And the 15th carbon is having methoxy, 15 methoxy. 
So here parent chain length of 23 carbons, right? 23 carbons. So that ECOSA is the parent chain name. ECOSA, right? And uh, sixth carbon, uh, 13th carbon are having two double bonds. So that let me mention 6, 13 diene. And 19th carbon is accompanied by triple bond. 19 ion is mentioned. And you can find the ketonic uh, presidential functional groups of both third and ninth carbon atoms, which are mentioned with the 3, 9 dione. This is the way we can assign the name for the given organic compound as per IUPAC nomenclature, right? So this is somewhat typical, but uh, if you solve step by step, it is some, somewhat uh, easy right we have to follow what rules we are following here first of all we have to we have to find the way from which direction we have to start numbering least distance for the highest priority group is higher uh, preferential right so here ketone is of third carbon from left side from this side it will be of 15th carbon so that third carbon is more preferable that is the first uh, fundamental we have to follow and later on Wherever functional groups are present, we have to assign numbering for those. After assigning numbering, what we have to do, alphabetical order, we have to go through. In, the, in that alphabetical order, mention the carbon and what group present on that. And uh, later on, the entire chain length is given as uh, 23 carbon chain is the ECOSA. And where the double bonds are resided, where triple bond is there, and finally, uh, what will be the main functional group, whichever present ketone, right? This is the way we can complete the name as per the IUPAC protocol, even this much length of chain is given. Okay, so move on to question number two. Question number two is accompanied by multiple questions. Again, let's solve one by one. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is the kind of, uh, uh, by, by observing the question we have to understand what method they are following by which method the compound can be synthesized the compound can be extracted that is the way we have to answer give the name of the process that is used okay method of synthesis or method of extraction or else method of separation they are asking for right so here multiple questions like uh, to produce ammonia from nitrogen to separate nitrogen from the liquid air uh, to produce bromine from the molten lead bromide to separate undissolved solid uh, from aqueous solution to produce amino acid from the protein. These many questions are there. Uh, the thing is, need not to go for any chemical reaction, any chemical process, only the thing, what method they are following in order to convert, in order to convert starting material into the product. First one is said to be conversion of nitrogen into ammonia. This is the most advantageous process we can say, uh, being it is the kind of uh, agricultural applicable process, nitrogen is the highest abundant element in the universe. Though it is highest abundant, but it is not available in the utilized form to the plant material and the plant requires nitrogen in the higher quantity. The essential elements for the plants are NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Uh, for the crop, highest crop yield, for that purpose, we need urea or else ammonia or else ammonia related products which used to synthesize their proteins in order to give the high yields of their crops. For that purpose, ammonia synthesis plays the vital role in the industrial process. Chemical industry, moreover, we can say fertilizer industry, right? So for that purpose, let's see, making of ammonia by the process called Haber. Haber process is applicable in order to synthesize ammonia. Uh, where nitrogen can be catalytically blended with the hydrogen so that it will be turned into ammonia gas and it, it uh, got converted into a combined form and uh, further uh, process of uh, fertilizer manufacturing is possible. Here, the entire method is provided. Nitrogen can be taken from the air and the hydrogen from the natural gas. We are not taking any kind of material uh, from the synthetic source, all are from the nature. Uh, nitrogen taken from the air and hydrogen taken from the natural gas, both are mixed in the ratio of 1 is to 3 by the volume. Nitrogen, hydrogen ratio was taken as 1 is to 3 in the blended mode uh, by their volume. And uh, they got heated at uh, 450 degrees centigrade temperature, 200 atmospheric pressure using iron catalyst. Being it is the catalytic reduction of nitrogen so that iron catalyst can be applied transition metal. Gases are condensed and ammonia will be 
converted into a liquid form being uh, it is a high pressurized condition you can obtain this ammonia under liquid form liquid ammonia get collected as the output by using Haber method it is the well-known process move on to second one let's go with the problem first second question is to separate nitrogen from the liquid air as already uh, everybody aware that uh, air is the mixture of all the gases what gases are present in the air? Nitrogen is around the 70 percentage and 20 um, percent oxygen will be there. 0.03 percent carbon dioxide resided. Traces of noble gases also accompanied in the air. Uh, this is a kind of blend or mixture of gases whichever present around us. We will breathe continuously that air. Then how can we separate this nitrogen from liquid air? The process is said to be fractional distillation. Fractional distillation is the method where all the fractions got collected according to their boiling point values, right? Initially, we are taking air under pressurized conditions. Air, air will be taken and uh, subjected to pressure. Whenever air pressurized, what happens? It gets condensed. That means liquefied air we will get. And uh, that liquefied air is passing through the uh, passing through the pump where hot air, it will be turned into hot air. Now it entered into the device where all the fractions get collected. All the fractions got separated by means of uh, rising temperature. At their level of boiling point, that fraction will be collected. Cold compressed air is coming out from this device. And uh, uh, what uh, separator will be? The device here is connected, is called a separator, where all the fractions got collected individually. Separator used to separate all the fractions where nitrogen is uh, collected at this output and here organ as everybody aware that organ is the kind of noble gas is uh, found in uh, air uh, as the kind of uh, mixed uh, ingredient so that the nitrogen is collected from this outlet organ is collected from this outlet and uh, uh, liquid oxygen is also collected uh, because it is the mixture of nitrogen oxygen and uh, noble gases so many noble gases also present in that so that all the different fractions got collected according to their boiling point value by the process called the fractional distillation so that how can we separate nitrogen from air by the process called fractional distillation move on to question number three let's see what is the question number three to produce the bromine from molten lead bromide lead bromide is the compound from this lead bromide, we need to go for bromine. Separation of bromine is required. That method is said to be electrolysis. Electrolysis stands for by applying the external current. If you are going to break the given compound, it's said to be a electrolysis, right? Molten lead bromide was taken. Molten lead bromide stands for lead bromide solid was taken and heated to the temperature where it uh, converted into a liquefied form that is melting of lead bromide called the molten lead bromide. Molten lead bromide was taken and subjected to the external current and one cathode and either anode was there. Anode is uh, accompanied by the positive charge. Cathode is given with the negative charge over here. Whenever lead bromide is under this electrical current, what happens? Bromide ions are moving towards the anode where uh, positive charge will gain the negative bromide ions so that bromide will be uh, moving towards this anode and where uh, it loses electrons and binds with the another bromine so that finally we will get the molecule called a bromine gas. Anode will give the bromine gas over there and uh, wherever lead ions are there, lead ions are accompanied by plus two charge and cathode is having negative charges so that uh, cathode will give the electrons to the lead positive ions. So lead ions are uh, accepting electrons so that uh, ionic lead is converted into metallic lead at the cathodic region. This is the way bromide converted into bromine gas, uh, lead cation converted into lead metal by the process called electrolysis. This is the way we can synthesize the process known as electrolysis. Move on to question number D. To separate an undissolved solid from the aqueous solution. So undissolved. There is a aqueous solution and undissolved solid. If both are present together, how can we separate them? What method we are adopting here? Instead of one, we are choosing two methods. One is said to be filtration method. This is the way you can, you can go for filtration. Filtration stands for what? Take a funnel. 
uh, glass funnel was taken and this is the volumetric flask which is immersed in this and uh, filter paper is inserted so that whatever uh, you know, what muddy water or muddy aqua solution what we have where solid and liquid are present together can be poured from this uh, funnel so that we can trap all the solid particles on this filter paper and the liquid can drain them into this volumetric flask. This is the way we can clearly separate solid from the liquid. So this is the simplest method we can say. And another scientific method we are following is called a separating, separating funnel method. Separating funnel method is, uh, is based on gravity, gravitational force. What we are doing, whatever muddy liquid is there, that means a solid accompanied with aqueous solution, both are mixed together and uh, are added with the suitable solvent, which is easily evaporated solvent can be added into that. Separating flask is the kind of device you can clearly see over here. It is, it is the glass funnel and uh, accompanied with the lid. So we have to close the lid and shake uh, uh, uniformly in order to mix all the ingredients very uniformly. So the, uh, after mixing this uh, separating flask for a longer time, we have to open the lid and uh, uh, place aside for our separation of two layers, two distinctive layers uh, without any agitation. Uh, we are not supposed to shake it. So place uh, as such for some time so that two layers will be slowly separated. Whatever layer density, solid particles can, uh, uh, can be deposited at the bottom. As per the gravity, they will they will uh, accommodate it at the bottom and the liquid layer at the topmost region as per their density. Right, this is a, in either way we can we can say scientific way for the separation of solid from the liquid. Two methods you can choose um, for the separation of solid and the liquid. Simple simple filtration we can say, or else a separating funnel we can use in order to separate solid from the liquid. Fine. If you open this uh, knob, what happens? Liquid will be totally drained out and solid remains in this funnel only because solid will not flow as uh, solvent is moving, right? So that's the reason why this is the way we can separate um, solid from the liquid. Both methods are acceptable only, right? Move on to next question called E, to produce amino acid from proteins. Right. Everybody aware about how can we synthesize protein from amino acid? Everybody need protein actually because it is the biomolecule. Every time we require protein for healthy growth, um, in order to make muscles strong, in order to build the body, uh, you know, grow the body. For all these purpose, we need proteins, right? Right. Uh, in order to synthesize proteins, amino acids are important. They are asking for to produce amino acids from proteins. This is called a reverse phase synthesis. Right. First, let's see what is uh, what is called a protein synthesis from amino acids and how can we reverse this process. Both we will discuss in detail. Let's see. This is the uh, fifth one. So here, if you see amino acid, amino acids are the tiny particles you can see over here when they are knotted in particular manner and there is a long chain called a peptide will be generated. And these peptide chains uh, got the cross linked or else they are growing in the longer way. And finally, you will get the protein of long chain. We can say it is a long chain biopolymer called the protein bounded with the peptide bonds. This is the way we can synthesize proteins actually. Right, the entire process is said to be anabolism. Anabolism is the method where simple, uh, small amino acids got connected in particular series, and they are used to make the peptide chain. And this peptide chain further uh, made or coiled, or else that depends. Uh, proteins are of different. The globular proteins will be there. Um, rod shaped proteins will be there. That depends upon their arrangement, orientation, what uh, kind of linkages they are having. So uh, finally, they are converted into a complex protein molecule like this. The entire process said to be anabolism. So they are asking for how can we make amino acids starting from this protein, right? That is called what reversing. Let's reverse the entire process. So whatever long chain protein is there, by means of protease enzyme, and uh, they, the process is said to be digestion, and they are converted into a simple tiny particles called amino acids. Myself, it is known as digestion process, right? Whatever protein synthesis is there, that protein synthesis is called anabolism. Whereas 
uh, replication, that means reverse of this protein into a amino acid tiny particles, it's a to be a digestion process. This is the way we can answer all the questions, whatever given in the question number two. And this is the question collected from Cambridge Assessment International Education. Move on to question number three. Question number three is collected from JE Advanced 2022 question paper and the conducted in the August. So here question is from electrochemistry, the reduction potential E0 values are provided in voltage of MnO4 minus manganese ion, aqueous manganese ion is provided and the manganese solid. Here is somewhat complex uh, kind of transformation you can see. MnO4 minus where it is of uh, manganate ion is given and finally converted into a metallic manganese solid. So here initially the compound or ion is said to be in the plus seven oxidation state around the central metal. Whereas after the entire process of uh, reduction, we can say converted into zero oxidation state around the central metal. Right. So the reduction potentials are provided. Uh, we have to go for the calculation of delta G internal energy of total reactions to be calculated. And uh, whereas we got the uh, reduction potential values uh, for E naught for MnO4 minus to MnO2 is given as 1.68. Then MnO2 to Mn plus 2, it is given as 1.21 volts. Mn plus 2 to Mn0, it is given as minus 1.03 volts. So these many transformations we observe uh, in order to calculate this. First of all, we have to see what kind of changes we are noticing. Initially, uh, the compound provided is MnO4 minus, which is called manganate ion, where manganese, central manganese acquiring plus 7 oxidation state by gaining three electrons, MnO2 is formed where plus seven is turned into plus four. Decrease in the oxidation state around the central metal is called reduction and it is gaining three electrons so that plus four will be attained. This MnO2 manganese dioxide, we can say that further accepting two more electrons and will be converted into Mn plus two ion. This Mn plus 2 again said to be what? Reduction because plus 4 to plus 2 is again decreased, descending, right? That's why we can say again reduction Mn plus 2 further converted into Mn0 where oxidation state retained is 0 around the central metal, right? In order to convert a plus 2 into 0, again we need to accept two more electrons. This is the entire series of chemical transformation where plus 7 converted into 0. The difference between plus 7 to plus 4 is said to be 3. This is called its valency. And the plus 4 to plus 2 is said to be 2. That is its valency. And plus 2 to 0, again, 2 difference will be there. The required reaction in order to calculate Gibbs free energy will be delta G total. Here, this dot indicates what standard conditions, right? Delta G naught is equal to delta G naught 1 delta G naught to 2 plus delta G naught to 3. The sum of individual Gibbs free energies are taken in order to calculate the total Gibbs free energy of the entire chemical reaction, right? In order, in order to calculate this one, the entire total one, total Gibbs free energy difference is how much? 7. That's why let me mention 7 into E. It's a potential can be taken over here. Why we are taking 7? The entire change from plus 7 to 0, the entire change, total change is said to be 7 valency difference. So that let me mention total 7 and E is taken as it's a standard electrode potential. Fine. Valency into standard electrode potential is taken as it's a Gibbs free energy. Right. So here uh, for delta G naught 1. So delta G naught 1 means plus 7 to plus 4. Plus 7 to plus 4, how much? Uh, 1.68. Plus 7 to plus 4, it is given as 1.68. 1.68 is given. And where the valence is, the difference between these two is said to be 3, right? So that 1.63 is the reduction potential. It to be multiplied with its valency. What valency? Plus 7 to plus 4, the difference is 3 valency. To be multiplied for delta G1. This finish, no? Then move on to delta G2. Delta G2 means what? Uh, MnO2 to 
mn plus 2. This transformation, the transformation requires this mn O2 to mn plus 2. This transformation requires 1.21 volts of current, right? So that is given 1.21. And moreover, delta G2, so that in order to get this, uh, get this uh, gives a free energy, uh, electrode potential can be multiplied with valency. So what valency we have? Mn O2 to Mn plus 2, the uh, difference is 2, no? This is said to be its valency. So that, so reduction potential can be multiplied with the 2. This is called its valency. This is for what? Delta G2. Move on to delta G3. Delta G3 for what? Uh, Mn plus 2 when converted into Mn0. This conversion reduction potential to be taken and the valency to be taken, right? So Mn plus 2 to Mn, that transformation requires minus 1.03 volts. See, minus 1.03 volts to be multiplied with the 2. Why 2? Here valency for Mn plus 2 to Mn0 will be 2, no? So that we have to multiply with the 2. So that this is the entire equation you can, uh, whatever values are there, all the values got uh, calculated. So that we will get 5.4. This entire term will become 5.4. Here 7 into E is equal to 5.4. E is equal to 5.4 by 7, no? So that it will be converted into 0 0.77 volts, right? 0 0.77 volt, double seven volt is the uh, potential, required reduction potential for the entire chemical reaction. That will be the answer. Reduction potential will be calculated in this manner. In order to calculate the reduction potential, first of all, we have to go for its Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy equation is very simple. Total Gibbs free energy is equal to individual Gibbs free energy is delta G1, delta G2, delta G3. We have to sum up. Right. So uh, from this equation, you, you are going to calculate its reduction potential value very simply as 0 0.77. For question number three, correct answer will be 0 0.77 volts for manganese ion to manganese metal, right? So move on to question number four. Question number four, again, it is the kind of uh, problem only, problem solving analysis, uh, analogy we are going with. Dissolving 1.24 grams of white phosphorus in the boiling sodium hydroxide solution in the inert atmosphere gives a gas cube. The amount of copper sulfate in grams required completely consume the gas Q is, right? So this is the kind of, uh, first of all, we have to know what chemical equation they are following. Later on, we have to go for its calculation as well, right? So here, white phosphorus can be taken and added with sodium hydroxide in, in a earth mass here. So whenever these two are reacted, uh, the compound Q will be formed. Whatever Q formed can be passed through the copper sulfate. Copper sulfate used to absorb this gas Q. So let's see how can we solve this problem. So whenever phosphorus is added with sodium hydroxide, phosphorus is of tetravalent in nature so that you can put on P4. So P4 can be treated with sodium hydroxide under moisture conditions so that it will be converted into pH3 called phosphine and the sodium dihydrogen phosphate. Okay, NaH2PO2, phosphate, not phosphate, sorry. Sodium dihydrogen phosphate will be formed, right? Mm -hmm. So they are saying that whatever Q formed is passing through the copper sulfate. Q is pH3 here. That means the phosphine. pH3 is called phosphine. That Q is passing through the copper sulfate solution. What it will form? Copper phosphide will be formed and sulfuric acid is excluded here. This is the possible chemical equation, right? So number of moles of phosphorus we need. Always moles is equal to weight by gram molecular weight. How much phosphorus they gave? 1.24 grams of white phosphorus we have. No. So that... Uh, weight of phosphorus is given as 1.24 in the it's a by weight by molecular weight is number of moles so weight is 1.24 molecular weight of phosphorus is 31 and uh, these 31 phosphorus are having four number so that 31 can be multiplied with four number so 1.24 by 31 into 4 the number of moles will become 0 0.01 phosphorus is having 0 0.01 moles 
So 0.01 moles are producing 0.01 moles of phosphine because whatever P4 is there, that many pH3 are generated. So that 0.01 moles of phosphorus will generate 0.01 moles of phosphine gas, right? It's very clear. Whenever 0.01 moles of phosphine is reacted with the copper sulfate, but copper sulfate taken in 3 moles, no? And 2 moles of phosphine is reacted, no? So that it will become 3 by 2 into 0.01 moles of copper sulfate. This is the way we can go for the number of moles calculation. Fine. So whenever we do this, it will become 0.03 by 2 moles. For what? Uh, copper sulfate. Copper sulfate moles will be 0.03 by 2 moles. Okay. So number of moles, you know, then it is obvious to calculate weight of copper sulfate. Weight is equal to number of moles into molecular weight. Gram molecular weight will be taken. Number of moles of copper sulfate just calculated as 0 0.03 by 2 and can be multiplied with its gram molecular weight that is 159. So when you do this, uh, you will get 2.385 grams. This is the weight of copper sulfate. Actually, 0.385 can be rounded up as uh, 2.39 grams. 2.39 grams of 2.39 grams of uh, copper sulfate is required in order to consume the gas Q. Q is phosphine. So, correct answer will be 2.39 grams of copper sulfate. Okay. So, for question number 4, 2.39 grams of copper sulfate is the correct answer. This is the way we can solve the problem. Uh, purely, it depends upon the number of moles and the balanced chemical equation. Stoichiometric equation is required to, uh, we need to write the stoichiometric equation. Then only we can go for how to calculate moles, how to convert moles into weight of the compound. Number of moles is equal to weight by gram molecular weight. Weight is equal to number of moles into gram molecular weight. So if you know this kind of conversion relation so that it is obvious to solve the problem, right? So this is the way we can solve this uh, analytical chemistry question. Move on to question number five. This is the question collected from Gurukulam Degree College Lecturer Entrance Exam conducted by Telangana. Which one of the correct order of increasing strength of adsorption in column chromatography? Right. So increasing strength of adsorption in column chromatography. So when you go for column chromatography, what kind of uh, adsorption strength will be there? Highest adsorbing strength is given for ketones, lateron esters, lateron ethers, lateron alkenes. This is the way adsorption strength will be there. Uh, let's see how can we uh, explain this uh, kind of relation, how this ascending order will be provided, what Actually, this uh, adsorption strength depends upon its polarity. What relation we have, entire thing we will discuss in detail. So, first of all, we have to know what is column chromatography. Column chromatography stands for there is a glass column can be taken. A cylindrical glass column will be there. Where uh, in the stationary phase will be there. Silica, silica kind of things uh, can be uh, what loaded into this column and where mobile phase solvent, the suitable solvent can be poured over there. Whatever sample you want to separate, the sample will be loaded on this top. After, after inserting the sample, we have, to, we have to pour the solvent, which is said to be a mobile phase. What solvent will do? Solvent always having tendency to flow down. As per the gravitational force, that will come down. Whenever solvent is moving uh, along with the solvent, the sample also tends to move down. But here the process proceeded in this uh, entire chromatography is adsorption. Certain particles will be adsorbed by the silica surface. So because of that adsorption, where whatever compounds or whatever uh, kind of uh, compounds we are taking in the sample, having highest affinity for the adsorption will remain with that uh, stationary phase and uh, free molecules will come down. They will drain very fastly. Whichever compounds having high polarity can bind with the silica particles very firmly and adsorbs very strongly. 
so that uh, non absorbing non polar compounds will drain very fastly this is the way adsorption is the process that is the surface phenomenon on the sol uh, surface of the silica if you are taking silica as the stationary phase on the surface of silica what happens polar molecules are firmly uh, adhered and whatever non polar compounds are there they are flowing very uh, fastly so this is the way based on the extent of adsorption process we can separate the various layers of the sample though we are having mixture in the starting material there is a possibility to separate based on their affinity to bind with the solvent our stationary phase if it's strongly binding with stationary phase they are they are moving very slowly they can be collected at the last which are having least affinity to bind with the stationary phase they are moving very fluently and they can be collected at first this is the way different uh, different uh, compounds are having different flow rate if three persons are allowed to run three persons may not having equal uh, velocity equal uh, way of running right in the same way here also whenever we are taking the mixture of compounds as the sample whenever mobile phase is drained through that one some of the particles having high flow rate can be collected at first and the slowly moving particles can be collected next and still slow particles can be collected at the last because of their high polarity and high affinity to bind with the uh, stationary phase uh, that's the reason why ketones uh, move on to next this is the way collection so initially we are taking uh, what bunch of uh, bunch of starting material will be taken where you can find a sample uh, sample which is in the combined form and here mobile phase is inserted from the top region whenever mobile phase inserted what happens these compounds are draining like this and one of the molecule is moving firstly neither molecule uh, is moving somewhat slowly whatever molecule moving very fastly can be collected first whichever molecule flowing very slowly can be collected next this is the way we can go for the separation of mixture by means of this chromatography which is said to be column chromatography so order of polarity what polarity stands for polarity is nothing but any compound having tendency to make two poles two poles nothing but what positive pole and negative pole positive charge and negative charge this is the way any compound can be uh, can be separated not completely partially separated into positive and negative poles which is said to be a polar compound right so whatever uh, functional groups provided whatever compounds provided in the uh, in the question one is called olkin olkin is having double bond over there which is having least polarity so that it was at the bottom and ether next level where oxygen having certain extent but not maximum so this is of second level of uh, polar uh, least polar compound we can say ether is in the next level ester where you can find more oxygen atoms no double bond o is there any other oxygen is also there so that uh, certain extent of polarity got increased uh, here ketone ketone where you can find c double bond o oxygen carbon double bond ha having higher polarity rate over here that's the reason why it was in the topmost region high polarity that's the reason why high rate of adsorption towards the stationary phase and uh, eluted at the last the compound which is having least polarity having highest mobility rate and the compound having highest polarity having least mobility rate this is the way uh, they are asking for polarity they are asking for increasing strength of adsorption more adsorption will be given for increasing polarity give the increasing adsorption no? so that uh, more polarity we uh, observe for ketone so that more adsorption will be given for ketone only and next level ester next level ether next level olkin will be there this is the right order olkins with least polarity next level ether next level ester next level ketone and the same order will be proceeded for adsorption as well this is the correct answer for question number 5 option number 1 is the correct answer move on to question number 6 which is the last question of the session this is the way we can give the uh, increasing order olkins is the least less than ether less than ester less than ketone 
right? So this is some more detailed explanation for how polarity matters. Separation of the mixture is given by the chromatography. Chromatography is the technique in order to separate the mixture is the basic, basic thing uh, for the chromatography. Chromatography is used to separate all the compounds which are present in the mixture. That is the most important thing. Where we can find the stationary phase and mobile phase in that. Stationary phase is the stationary, which is not moving anywhere. Mobile phase having tendency to move. Mobile means movable, right? So uh, according to the uh, mobile phase, whatever compounds are less polar can drain first. And least, uh, least polar, uh, sorry, high polar compounds will be absorbed more so that they will come. They will elute it at last one. This is the way we can go for the separation of mixture. So column chromatography is provided over here. So polarity, high polar compounds are at top. List polar compounds are at the bottom. So hope that uh, chromatography, absorption, separation, polarity, everything is very clear. Move on to question number six. Which of the following solvent is having better separation capacity in chromatography? Just now we discussed about chromatography. Again, the question came from the same analytical part. Chromatography question itself, all these are called what solvents only. Just now we said that in chromatography, two phases will be there. One is said to be stationary phase and either said to be mobile phase. Mobile phase is nothing but solvent. All the options whichever provided here are the part of solvents only called mobile phases. Among these many, which is uh, efficient, efficient mobile phase in the chromatography, which is having higher separation capacity, that is called a cyclohexane, right? Toluene is there, carbon tetrachloride is there, cyclohexane is there, inhexane is there among all. Highest efficiency is accorded for cyclohexane. Let's see how can we answer that. So the, this is collected from the LIBA text, optimization and column performance. The goal of chromatographic separation is to take the sample more than one solute. So mixture of compounds more than one solute if present that can be separated such that elutes by itself, its elution is required. Whenever it is eluted, different parts can be collected at different positions. Our ability to separate uh, two solutes from each other to resolve them affected by the number of variables, how we can optimize the separation of two solutions as a subject of this section, okay? So here, uh, whenever in the chromatography, you are going to separate all the mixtures, how can we optimize the conditions? So uh, especially our question is about what separation capacity, separation capability of different solvents. For that purpose, uh, the required the required mobile phases used in the uh, chromatography are non-polar solvents are preferable, whereas chloroform can be taken, cyclohexane can be taken, benzene can be taken, carbon tetrachloride can be taken. These are commonly used uh, non-polar solvents which are required in the chromatographic elution process. That may be high-performance liquid chromatography or else any other method, the mobile phase required to be non-polar in nature. This is more preferable in nature, right? And uh, uh, among all uh, coefficients, the infinite dilution effectivity coefficient of cyclohexane, cyclohexene, benzene, and then dimethyl formamide, and then dimethyl pyridone, and then dimethyl acetamide, phenyl acetate. These many, all these are said to be what's eluting devices only. All these are called mobile phases only, and they are detected. They are examined at the temperature from 40 to 80 degrees centigrade. Among all, more efficiently found is cyclohexane benzene. This is enough for us. Need not to go further because the highest efficiency is accorded from uh, cyclohexane benzene combination. So that we will move on to cyclohexane. So very simple to choose this cyclohexane. So for question number six, cyclohexane is the correct answer. It is experimentally evidented data. Fine. So which of the following solvent having better separation capacity in the chromatography? That is the cyclohexane, right? So by this, we entirely completed the session. And this is the way we can clearly see what is the mobile phase, what is stationary phase, what is the sample. So entire blue color region is said to be mobile phase having tendency to move. And stationary phase are fixed locations, fixed positions to which 
that mobile phase is uh, flowing, right? And the sample uh, which which to be separated can be drained over here. So this is the kind of sample particles we can see the triangles and all these uh, square particles. All these are said to be sample particles. And this is the way paper chromatogram can be separated. This is called paper chromatogram. So this is the way chromatography can be performed and mo uh, mobile phase, stationary phase. Stationary phase generally taken as the silica particles only having the tendency to absorb the uh, all different kind of uh, samples. But mobile phases, uh, polarity of mobile phases matters. So by this, we entirely completed the session. All six questions are detailed, explained, and the different sources are collected from all these. The um, Whatever data collected uh, will be hopefully informative. So I'm sincerely requesting to like the channel, comment which part is really interesting for you and which part we will we have to improve further and share with the aspirants we are uh, which are seriously preparing for the examination either entrance or else a competitive exam subscribe the channel in order to receive more such kind of updates in the near future and thank you very much for your pa uh, for your patient listening hope this will be helpful for your entrance or any competitive exam wish you all the best thank you very much